I'm Linda Baker, the Learning Director at the Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children. On behalf of the Learning Network and Knowledge Hub teams, welcome to today's webinar, Understanding and Addressing Issues of Gender Identity and Sexuality When Working with Trauma Survivors Through Trauma-Informed Care Approaches. I'm located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapewak, and the Attawandaran peoples. These lands are connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. Please think about the traditional lands you are currently situated on and join us in acknowledging and thanking the generations of Indigenous peoples who have cared for these lands and in celebrating the continued strength and spirit of Indigenous peoples. The ongoing work to make the promise of truth and reconciliation real in our communities, and in particular, to bring justice for murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited individuals across the country should inform our discussions in this webinar and beyond. I'm honored to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jillian Shear. This is especially special to us because we were hoping to bring Jillian in person to a trauma conference and the pandemic came and we had to cancel. So we were thrilled when Dr. Jillian Shear agreed to come and do this webinar. Dr. Shear is a licensed counseling psychologist and an assistant professor of psychology at Syracuse University. Dr. Shear received a doctorate in counseling psychology from Boston College and subsequently completed a T32 postdoctoral research fellowship at the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS at Yale Yee School of Public Health, as well as a pre-doctoral clinical internship at Mount Sinai St. Luke's. Dr. Shear's NIH-funded research is interdisciplinary. Their work seeks to inform epidemiological, etiological, and clinical treatment models of sexual and gender minorities, alcohol use, and related morbidities through the specification of psychosocial stressors and trauma. Dr. Jillian Shear, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Go ahead and share my screen. And you just need to swap to the presenter mode. One second. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. So thanks again for having me um, as we uh, talk today about um, some of my research that informed how we understand and address issues related to gender identity and sexual orientation or sexual identity, particularly among those who have been exposed to trauma and thinking about ways that we can integrate um, these issues in, in trauma-informed care approaches. So I just want to start by giving an overview of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, I'll start by talking about unique stressors facing two-spirit, um, LGBTQ, or sexual or gender minority. Uh, I'll use these terms inter interchangeably today, um, including exposure to violence. I'll also talk broadly about my work that seeks to identify victimization risk and protective factors um, among LGBTQ or sexual and gender minority people. And I'll be specifically talking about dating and sexual violence, uh, or intimate partner violence and adverse childhood experiences. I'll then talk about this population's barriers to help seeking. And finally, I'll discuss clinical and practice implications for victimized sexual and gender minority people. And uh, we'll leave time for discussion and, and questions. I'll now shift into talking about some terms that I'm going to use to describe uh, sexual and gender minority you know, or LGBTQ folks. Sexual minority identity labels are culturally specific, they're widely varying, and they're ever evolving. Uh, some commonly used terms are lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, queer, asexual, although this is not an exhaustive list. 
And rather, considering identities as separate, it's important to consider multiple identities together. For example, thinking about sexual orientation, gender identity, race and ethnicity, or immigration status, because all of these uh, social identities are essential to mental health. In both the scientific literature on health and in popular discourse, the term sex and gender are often conflated. Sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression are distinct but interrelated characteristics. Gender identity is defined as a person's felt or inherent sense of one's own gender. Um, gender expression refers to the external and physical appearance of a person's gender identity, makeup, hairstyle, as well as behaviors uh, that, ex that express aspects of one's gender. And gender expression may or may not be consistent with a person's gender identity. And this is, a, this is uh, referred to as gender conformity or gender nonconformity. Now, although sexual, sexual orientation may involve attraction to various aspects of gender, an individual's gender identity and expression do not imply any specific sexual orientation. That is, a sexual minority person may be cisgender, transgender, non-binary, or identify with other diverse uh, genders. Intersex is a general term for a variety of conditions in which a person is born with a reproductive or sexual anatomy system that does not fit into the typical definitions of female or male. They may be some combination of male and female. And intersex people come to an awareness of their atypicality when doctors or caregivers notice something different about their bodies versus trans people or transgender people who have an internal sense of sex and gender incongruency. There is no one common set of biological traits used to distinguish the intersex community. Um, however, the central experience that's often shared by this community is the medicalization um, of, their, of their anatomy. And the practice of surgically altering genitalia of intersex infants was endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics in the 1990s. Um, some have argued that all children must have their gender identity fixed early in life for a consistent and successful gender identity to uh, form. However, current approaches advocate for surgery in newborns um, when functionality is impaired and surgery for cosmetic reasons to enhance parent-child attachment or relative parental distress is not proven to be effective. Transgender uh, refers to, um, use, often used as an umbrella term to refer to individuals whose gender identity transgresses traditional definitions of male and female. Uh, many trans or transgender people experience themselves um, as a gender other than the one that they have been assigned. And many trans people do not desire or choose to have hormonal or surgical body modifications. Cisgender, conversely, is a term that refers to individuals whose sex assigned at birth is congruent with their gender identity. So just keeping all of this in mind, uh, terms are crucial in terms of finding out what terms a person uses and then using this language to convey respect and openness to that person. However, we also know that terms can be meaningless and that they tell you almost nothing about what you might need to know uh, in terms of how to provide appropriate culturally sensitive trauma-informed services. Transitioning now to take a look at health outcomes that LGBTQ people uh, disproportionately suffer compared to heterosexual people. Before I do that though, I do wanna highlight um, resiliencies in this population um, in that most sexual and gender minority or LGBTQ folks do not exhibit psychological or physical distress, indicating that despite many minority stressors or stigma related stress that's specifically related to their sexual or gender identity and trauma exposure, a resilience is normative for the majority of this population. And concurrently, sexual and gender minority people who have multiple intersecting marginalized identities, including sexual and gender minority people of color, uh, often display resilient stigma coping strategies, such as embracing positive aspects of the self, being involved in community and engaging in social activism, or what's termed as positive intersectionality in the literature. National health initiatives emphasize the importance of eliminating health disparities among historically disadvantaged populations. The National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, or NIMHD, defines a health disparity as a health difference that adversely affects disadvantaged populations. This includes socioeconomically disadvantaged populations, racial ethnic minorities, underserved rural populations, and sexual and gender minorities, or LGBTQ people. 
And it was only in 2016 that um, the NIMHD designated sexual and gender minority individuals as a health disparity population. What came of this designation is that it facilitated the creation of tailored research projects, programs, and activities intended to tackle the distinct issues encountered by LGBTQ people. However, LGBTQ specific health disparities still persist today and novel methods to measure, address, and prevent them are still needed. Much of my work focuses on the LGBTQ community, many of whom are also socioeconomically disadvantaged, racial ethnic minorities, and from underserved rural populations. And then taking a look, uh, a little closer look at sexual orientation health disparities. The Institute of Medicine released a report in 2011 documenting large and persistent health disparities related to sexual orientation. And these disparities have been observed across a range of physical and mental health outcomes. Related to physical health, a consistent trend across population-based studies demonstrates that relative to heterosexual individuals, sexual minority populations or those who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual um, have elevated rates of HIV, particularly among gay bisexual men of color who are living in southern parts of uh, the United States. Uh, they suffer from migraines, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, asthma, stomach issues, and population-based studies also reveal elevated risks for depression, suicidality, anxiety, substance use, and, anxi and alcohol use-related disorders uh, for sexual minority men and women compared to heterosexual men and women. And my program of research uses um, a three-level uh, socioecological model to better understand and frame these health disparities to inform intervention development for this population. First, I wanna take a look at what might help to explain these disparities that we're noticing in mental and physical health, specifically among um, sexual and gender minority individuals. Minority stress theory was developed to explain why the prevalence of mental health problems was higher among sexual minorities compared to heterosexuals. And it proposed that this was due to the additional burden that sexual minorities experience because of their stigmatized social status. Now, several types of minority stress are described, as you can see here, along a continuum from distal stressors to proximal stressors. Distal stressors are those defined as objective events or events that um, exist outside of oneself, including discrimination, violence, microaggressions, whereas proximal minority stressors are defined as subjective processes that rely on perceptions and appraisals. And this includes internalizing stigma, um, expecting rejection, and needing to conceal one's sexual orientation or gender identity. Proximal stressors are internalized psychological conflicts that can be triggered by distal-related stressors, societal stigma, or prejudicial stereotypes. Transgender or gender non-binary, gender diverse individuals who hold sexual minority identities have additional proximal minority stressors that include internalized transphobia, um, including uh, needing to um, conceal one's gender expression, identity, uh, or pronoun use. One recent study that I published with colleagues indicated that over 43% of sexual gender minority young people ages 12 to 17 are reported experiencing multiple forms of victimization, including sexual harassment and dating violence. Now, building on minority stress theory, the psychological mediation framework describes the mechanisms through which these unique stressors influence mental health. The psychological mediation framework was developed to explain how minority stressors influence mental health. And it proposed that these distal minority stressors activate general psychological processes that confer risk for psychopathology, including hopelessness, negative self schemas, um, effective processes like um, poor emotion regulation or maladaptive coping process, and social processes like isolation and feelings of loneliness. And the psychological mediation framework primarily focused on general psychological processes, but it acknowledged that group specific processes like internalized stigma, expectations of rejection, and sexual orientation concealment may also explain these associations between distal minority stressors and psychopathology. Research has also supported that psychological mediation framework, demonstrating that the associations between stigma related stressors and mental health are mediated or explained by some of these general psychological processes, as well as group specific processes. One major social influence on LGBTQ people's health is dating violence, um, as, as many of you may know, or intimate partner violence or IPV. 
What is dating violence? Dating violence is known as a behavior within a dating or intimate relationship that causes physical, sexual, psychological harm, um, among others. And this can include acts of physical aggression, sexual coercion, psychological abuse, and co controlling behaviors. My colleagues and I several years ago described the nature of intimate partner violence in LGBTQ communities in this publicly available report um, that was funded by the US Department of Health and Human Services. And we note that um, intimate partner violence is a pattern of behavior used by one person in the relationship, although we know that uh, um, much of, of intimate partner violence can be bidirectional, um, uh, is used by one person in the relationship often to assert power and control over the other person and can include physical, sexual, psychological, financial, among other forms of abuse. We know that intimate partner violence is not about size, strength, who might be more butch or more masculine. We know that intimate partner violence is not a cat fight between women or just boys being boys between men. Violence uh, is perpetrated by women and it can be just as dangerous as that perpetrated by men. And men can be survivors. However, prevalence estimates does suggest that intimate partner violence disproportionately affects women. A critical first step in improving sexual assault prevention and treatment is identifying the prevalence of sexual violence in populations disproportionately affected by sexual violence. A report from the CDC um, indicates that national rates of sexual assault among cisgender sexual minorities are as high as 46% among lesbian women, 85% among bisexual women, 40% for gay men, 47% for bisexual men compared to 43% for heterosexual women and 21% for heterosexual men. And findings suggest that nearly half of transgender or other gender minority respondents, such as non-binary individuals, have been sexually assaulted in their lifetime. Transgender people are almost four times as likely to experience sexual violence compared to people who are not transgender or cisgender people. And given that perpetrators target victims who are perceived as less likely to resist or report victimization, Sexual violence estimates are higher for sexual gender minority people who have a disability, are homeless, and who have engaged in sex work. And because sexual gender minority people who are exposed to sexual violence victimization are often unwilling to report violence, statistical data reflecting lower, reflect lower rates of, in, of incidents than what would otherwise be the case, leading to minimal funding for direct services, advocacy, and prevention for sexual gender minority communities. There has been an increase in the literature on intimate partner violence among LGBTQ communities, and emerging evidence suggests that the prevalence of intimate partner violence may be as high or even higher for LGBTQ individuals compared to cisgender heterosexuals. Intimate partner violence among LGBTQ individuals is characteristically different from cisgender heterosexuals because of several unique factors, such as internalized stigma, um, level of outness of one or both individuals, one form of intimate partner violence that may be salient among LGBTQ communities is identity abuse or abuse tactics within an intimate relationship that leverages systemic oppression, such as homophobia, biphobia, transphobia. For example, one partner might threaten to out the other partner to their family if they break up with them, or one partner may threaten to uh, remove one's hormone access if they threaten to break up with them. As you can see here, over 54% of um, LGBTQ individuals experience psychological abuse, over 30% experience identity abuse, and almost 30% experience physical abuse. This study uh, demonstrated that gender identity disparities were found in identity abuse victimization, where transgender and non-binary adults experienced more identity abuse than cisgender sexual minority male and female young adults. Literature also finds that intimate partner violence is experienced at particularly high rates among transgender people. More than half of transgender people experience some form of intimate partner violence according to the National Intimate Partner Violence and Sexual uh, Violence Survey. Studies have shown that between 44 and 57% of transgender people experience psychological abuse or verbal abuse and controlling behaviors. 20 to 35% experience physical violence. Um, 35 to 46% experience um, hitting or burning type behaviors. Um, almost half, half of transgender people have experienced sexual intimate partner violence, including non-consensual um, uh, sexual touching or penetration. And between 27 and 73% have experienced 
um, identity abuse victimization or anti-transgender abuse within their primary relationship. And again, this, this might look like tactics that leverage a, per, a person's transgender status um, as a means of control. In addition to risk factors that contribute to intimate partner violence among cisgender heterosexual individuals like alcohol abuse, childhood exposure to intimate partner violence or witnessing domestic violence, sexual and gender minority individuals face, face additional stressors related to their stigmatized identities. This is known as minority stress, which I talked about earlier, and this might further elevate their risk of intimate partner violence. One central tenet of minority stress theory reflects that sexual and gender minority individuals experience higher levels of stress across um, multiple ecological levels, including individual levels, interpersonal levels, and structural levels uh, due to their stigmatized social status. Highlighting societal oppression and intimate partner violence, we know that societal um, oppression can affect dynamics of abuse within a relationship in several ways. It can be used as a weapon against a survivor and as a means of coercion. And societal oppression and discrimination can also intensify feelings of shame, fear, and isolation that can occur in abusive relationships. I wanna highlight unique forms of sexual violence um, facing LGBTQ individuals, um, such as when perpetra perpetrators may justify raping or sexually assaulting bisexual victims, because they might be relying on false myths that bisexuals are hypersexual. Um, along with more traditional forms of sexual violence victimization, anti-LGBTQ bias or anti-SGM bias can be used as sexual violence tactics against sexual gender minority people, um, such as when perpetrators intentionally sexual assault parts of a transgender victim's body that has gendered meaning or might used to have gendered meaning, such as genitals or breasts. And these types of pervasive beliefs about gender, sexual orientation, and sexual assault also have important implications for sexual and gender minority people's lower likelihood of utilizing support services following sexual assault. And specific to sexual and gender minority perpetrators, those who internalize stigma-related beliefs may be more likely to use sexual violence because they might view their sexual and gender minority partner as deserving of abuse, or they may wish to overcome their own feelings of disempowerment. And in addition, some sexual and gender minority people may justify using violence against their partner to cope with their own experiences of anti-sexual um, and gender minority bias. The nature of intimate partner violence victimization against LGBTQ people may be characteristically different from that used against cisgender heterosexual individuals, again, given these unique experiences of psychological, interpersonal, and structural forms of stigma that may be used as tactics within, of control within a relationship. Perpetrators of identity abuse may use um, cis-sexist or heterosexist, heterosexist tactics that emphasize LGBTQ intimate partner violence individuals' marginalized position in society. And these might, these might include threatening to out a partner's stigmatized identity without their consent, using derogatory language regarding their partner's sexual orientation or gender identity, undermining, attacking, belittling, or denying a partner's sexual orientation or gender identity, and isolating individuals from the LGBTQ community, uh, which is found to be very insular. Moving on to uh, talk about some case examples of identity abuse found in the literature so you can get a, a sense of um, kind of a felt experience of what this might look like. Uh, from a study uh, conducted by Guadalupe Diaz in 2016, one transgender or gender non-binary participant reported her attacks on my passability as a woman, it was an attempt to manipulate me, to take away something that I was feeling good about. And you know, I was able to present myself as female and learning how to look beautiful and look pretty and the way I dressed and the way I see myself, trying to turn that into a negative for me. It was taking away those things that I found self-fulfilling and trying to pull those away so that there would be a void there that she could come in and fill it. Here's another participant. I started doing or wearing some of the things he got, like the better bras and silicone. I even did more on my face, like the lips and cheeks referring to surgeries that were just easy one day things. He would praise me for that and then do stuff for me, like things that I had been asking to do, like just more public things. I just started to lose myself. I was just now this thing, this experiment or something of his to use and follow. 
It only made me more depressed, which made him more angry. And then that's when he got colder, more distant, more angry, and kind of like violent. Taking a step back for a moment, now that you have a sense of the prevalence of intimate partner violence in LGBTQ relationships, some might wonder why LGBTQ people and, and cisgender heterosexual individuals engage in abusive behavior. We know that most behavior stems from a need to gain power and control over another person in a relationship, but not all abusive behavior stems from the intent to exert power and control. Other reasons, as we know from the literature, include um, unlearned healthy relationship skills. So for example, many people who use abuse were children who witnessed domestic violence, reenacting prior victimization. As I, sh as I shared, LGBTQ people experience high rates of victimization in childhood and adulthood, and this might translate to reenacting prior victimization in current relationships. Trauma theorists have also spent a long time examining how early experiences of abuse and victimization lead to some of these reenacting abusive behaviors. We also know from the literature that abusive behavior um, can be a result a reaction of low self-esteem um, through gaining control over another human to raise their sense of self or self-concept. And research does find that there's high rates of LGBTQ youth who report both receiving and perpetrating different acts of intimate partner violence. Talking first about risk factors for perpetrating violence, um, minority stress um, has been shown in the literature to uh, serve as one main risk factor for perpetrating violence among LGBTQ individuals. Um, also disempowerment theory, uh, talks about how individuals who feel inadequate and lack self-efficacy might be at increased risk of using non-traditional means of power assertion, such as violence. And extending this theory to sexual and gender minorities who report dating violence, uh, those who feel high levels of inadequacy and powerlessness because of some experiences of stigma and discrimination may be more likely to engage in aggression towards their partner. And minority stressors uh, are associated with psychological and relational variables, such as depression, substance use, and low relationship quality, all of which are risk factors for perpetrating violence um, and, and health risks more broadly. Gender minority youth face stressors also unique to their experiences, transgender and non-binary. These stressors may help to explain their odds of perpetration compared to other gender minority youth who do not report, for example, sexual violence perpetration. We know from the literature that non-binary youth have, who have experienced trauma, um, such as early childhood, ex childhood abuse, are almost three times as likely as those who did not experience trauma um, to report sexual violence perpetration against their partner. We also know that internalized transphobia or negative beliefs about one's transgender identity is associated with higher odds of perpetration uh, for transgender boys and girls. Emotional and tangible support from informal um, or formal avenues can protect against the deleterious health impact of intimate partner violence victimization. And while it is critical for sexual and gender minority individuals who experience intimate partner violence to report intimate partner violence and seek assistance without fearing harm, rejection, or being criminalized, this population also faces significant help-seeking barriers directly related to their stigmatized social status. This next portion of the talk will discuss general intimate partner violence-related help-seeking processes, and it reviews the literature on help-seeking patterns and barriers among sexual and gender minorities who experience intimate partner violence. Broadly, help-seeking among individuals who experience intimate partner violence represents three stages that involve first, recognizing and defining the abusive situation as unmanageable, second, deciding to seek help, and third, accessing assistance from formal or informal avenues to remedy the situation. This might look like repairing the relationship, protecting against future abuse, or leaving an abusive situation or relationship. Formal avenues of support seeking include seeking mental health, medical, legal, advocacy, and housing services, whereas informal avenues may include asking friends, family, coworkers for a safe place to stay, for child care help, financial assistance, or emotional support. And formal inf and informal avenues of support increases intimate partner violence, um, survivor's sense of self-efficacy, 
and sense of ability to adapt to future uh, instances of threat um, or adaptive coping efforts. However, several contextual barriers such as inadequate structural response, like non-enforcement of protection orders, inaccessibility of appropriate resources like domestic violence shelters can hinder intimate partner violence related help seeking um, generally. In addition, barriers to accessing informal support may include experiencing dismissive attitudes from family or friends after revealing intimate partner violence experiences, and recent work considers a cultural context of intimate partner violence related stigma, like losing social status within networks because of an intimate partner violence victimization. And this overall reduces help seeking behavior. Specific to LGBTQ individuals who experience intimate partner violence, many also face stigma related to their, their sexual and gender minority identity when they seek help after experiencing intimate partner violence. Uh, we know that sexual and gender minority adults initially disclose intimate partner violence to informal sources of support, like family, friends, and coworkers, rather than to formal sources of support, like law, informant, law enforcers, clergy, crisis lines, shelters, advocates. And when accessing formal services, sexual and gender minority individuals may prefer those that more covertly address intimate partner violence, like mental health counseling more generally, rather than looking towards um, domestic violence specific services like shelters. In addition, rates of disclosure among sexual and gender minority individuals may vary as a function of their uh, sexual and gender minority status, among other demographic characteristics like immigration status, race and ethnicity, uh, income status or gender identity. For example, sexual minority women or those who identify as lesbian, bisexual or queer are more likely to report intimate partner violence to legal services than sexual minority men, maybe uh, due to internalized masculinity norms that discourage against um, acknowledging victimization in these communities. We also know that transgender women of color are the least likely to seek support following intimate partner violence due to very real and anticipated transphobia from law enforcement and experiences of police brutality. Stigma related to intimate partner violence and sexual and gender minority status creates multiple barriers to seeking um, and receiving adequate care and support. First, individual level barriers, including minority stress processes like internalizing negative beliefs about one's identities or experiences, uh, prevent many sexual and gender minorities from seeking help or disclosing intimate partner violence. And this can contribute to denying abuse, feelings of isolation, um, an avoidance of seeking help that's commonly seen in this population. Second, in a personal level, their uh, barriers include experiences of discrimination and prejudice by service providers, law enforcers, family, friends, and clergy members. Additional concerns for sexual and gender minorities include uh, fear of losing one's social network by disclosing in partner violence. Sexual and gender minority individuals may hold dismissive attitudes towards those within their community who report intimate partner violence exposure. And this can all um, limit the kinds of support that they can provide to others. And as is the case with more formal help seeking, um, many sexual and gender minorities fear confirming negative stereotypes about sexual and gender minority relationships, or even concerns about outing themselves or their partners um, in the process of seeking support. And so this all may reduce informal help-seeking behavior as well as formal help-seeking behavior. And third, minority stressors at the structural level include cultural norms and societal conditions that prevent sexual and gender minorities from receiving support they need, such as lacking effective care and services that are tailored to this population. For example, transgender women of color in particular face disproportionate levels of poverty, discrimination, being denied health care, um, this can, can overall contribute to their greater risk of intimate partner violence, HIV, and other service barriers compared to other uh, sexual and gender minorities and cisgender heterosexual individuals. The World Health Organization recognizes sexual violence victimization and other forms of domestic violence or intimate partner violence as preventable public health issues. And this is important to name because research underscores the importance of targeted prevention programs for reducing sexual and gender minority people's reduced reduce, uh, risk of sexual violence exposure. 
This could look like promoting community education about sexual violence, uh, implementing bystander interventions and policies that foster a zero tolerance attitude towards sexual violence. In addition, prevention efforts that target sexual and gender minority people and others who are at risk of perpetrating sexual violence against sexual and gender minority people are needed. Uh, given the widespread health consequences of sexual violence victimization among sexual and gender minority individuals, prevention and intervention strategies should identify readily accessible and culturally competent uh, services for this population. However, we know that sexual and gender minority individuals ex who experience sexual violence victimization and other forms of domestic violence face barriers to accessing services that are needed to recover from abuse. And so taken together, the findings that I've presented so far underscore the need to reduce help-seeking barriers um, among uh, violence-exposed sexual and gender minority individuals by developing affirmative training and tailored interventions uh, that, are, um, that are personalized to address sexual and gender minority individuals' unique needs. One of these avenues is uh, implementing evidence-based um, trauma-informed care approaches Trauma-informed care is a universal treatment framework that involves providing culturally sensitive services that build on survivor strengths, um, provide survivors with access to information on trauma. Um, it facilitates opportunities to connect with other survivors or for social connection. And it fosters agency to help survivors regain control of their bodies and lives following instances of violence. And one fundamental tenet of trauma-informed care or TIC is the assumption that all clients who walk through your door may have experienced some form of trauma. And it's using this assumption or awareness um, of the high prevalence of trauma, generally, and especially among sexual and gender minority individuals, to inform services. And this might look like um, trying to avoid triggering survivors when gathering history during an intake assessment, for example. The trauma-informed practice scales was developed by uh, Dr. Goodman and her colleagues in 2016. And this scale is an empirically, uh, theoretically informed measure that assesses the degree to which intimate partner violence survivors report receiving the following core components of trauma-informed care. Uh, one, one core domain of trauma-informed um, practice is that their environment of agency and mutual respect. So this might look like the extent to which survivors get to choose their own treatment goals. Access to information on trauma. This might look like opportunities for survivors to learn how intimate partner violence affects relationships and their body. Opportunities for connection. So this looks like the degree to which survivors uh, can provide and receive support from other survivors. Emphasis on strengths. So this might look like the perception um, of providers' level of respect for survivors' strengths. Cultural responsiveness, or the extent to which survivors feel their cultural backgrounds are respected. And support for parenting um, for those who have children. So the extent to which survivors learn about ways that intimate partner violence might affect their children. For a study that I had conducted with my colleagues, I included minority stress-related trauma-informed care as a core component of trauma-informed care for LGBTQ survivors. And this looks like the degree to which staff discusses experiences of discrimination with survivors. I use this domain instead of support for parenting, given the relevance of this dimension for the sample of LGBTQ intimate partner survivors, um, especially because over 70% of the sample did not report having children. Um, and this could also reflect the demographic of the sample as the mean age was 27. For the study that I'm going to be talking about, I hypothesized that including this domain or this subskill of minority stress-related trauma-informed care that specifically targets experiences of stigma and stress faced by LGBTQ people this might help improve the overall relevance of trauma-informed care for LGBTQ individuals as it relates to improving their health outcomes. What is it about trauma-informed care that might improve health outcomes for sexual and gender minority individuals? Trauma-informed care is conceptualized to target these same minority stress and universal risk factors, um, such as lack of social support and internalized discrimination uh, that's evidenced here and that I reviewed earlier. Um, and in the study I'm going to be talking about, I examined four mechanisms, which I termed mobilizing mechanisms, 
through which trauma-informed care could relate to better mental and physical health for sex and gender minority and my partner violence survivors. And these mobilizing mechanisms were included as mediators in the study. They were greater emotion regulation, greater empowerment, lower shame, lower loneliness. And these processes can counteract some of the immobilization that's linked to chronic experiences of victimization, such as emotion dysregulation, shame, isolation, disempowerment. And importantly, similar processes were conceptualized as mediators between stigma-related stress and health among LGBTQ people. Um, and there's emerging literature, literature on evidence-based interventions that target some of these, these minority stress or psychological processes in effort to improve health among LGBTQ individuals. And this underscores the point of needing to examine these, um, these mechanisms in relation to trauma-informed care for this population. This brings me to the conceptual framework of the study that I conducted. So as you can see here, I hypothesized that trauma perceptions of receiving higher levels of trauma-informed care would be both directly related to improved mental and physical health. And I hypothesized that these relationships between trauma-informed care and mental and physical health would be partially explained by the relationship between mobilizing mechanisms. And I controlled for socioeconomic status and the length of time that one was seeking services from a particular agency or provider. Just to give you a sense of who sought services related to intimate partner violence and its aftermath following experiences of intimate partner violence in this study, of the entire sample that was collected, almost 40% of those who experienced intimate partner violence within the last year sought services related to intimate partner violence in the past year. Whereas 57.6% sought services over their lifetime. And this 38.8% was, was the sample that we included in the study. And so participants were instructed to answer these trauma-informed care um, items related to a provider or service, or service agency that they spent the most time receiving services from in the past year, such as shelters, hotlines, or mental health counselors. Over 61% of sexual and gender minority individuals with intimate partner violence exposure in the past year did not seek services related to intimate partner violence last year. And given this information, more studies are needed to investigate help-seeking barriers and reasons why some LGBTQ people seek help while others don't. And as hypothesized, uh, greater perceptions of receiving trauma-informed care were associated with greater empowerment, um, and emotion regulation, lower social withdrawal. However, it was not associated with shame. And two of our mediators were associated with better mental health outcomes. And those were lower social withdrawal and shame. And contrary to our hypotheses in this study, uh, the other two mediators, empowerment and emotion regulation was not associated with mental health. So overall, this model tells us that trauma-informed care does not indirectly relate to better mental health through the set of mobilizing mechanisms we conceptualized in this study. As with mental health, uh, moving on to the physical health model, trauma-informed care was associated with greater empowerment and emotion regulation and lower social withdrawal. However, it was not associated with shame. And of our pr proposed mediators, Greater shame was the only variable that was associated with worse physical health. And overall, trauma-informed care was not indirectly associated with better physical health through our set of mobilizing mechanisms for this study. Taken together, LGBTQ intimate partner violence survivors who reported greater perceptions of experiencing a provider who fostered agency uh, reported greater feelings of empowerment and overall, positive associations were found between LGBTQ clients' perceptions of experiencing a provider who fostered agency and their psychosocial well-being, indicating that trauma-informed care component uh, related to fostering one's sense of agency or building on survivors' strengths in that regard may represent one of the most beneficial therapeutic factors in promoting LGBTQ um, intimate partner violence survivors' well-being. And this makes sense given that LGBTQ and intimate partner violence survivors experience compounding effects of disempowerment and, um, and shame, both related to experiences of 
chronic exposure to stigma-related stress, as well as um, intimate partner violence experiences. And the study also found that LGBTQ intimate partner violence survivors' uh, perceptions of experiencing a provider who focused on culture and promoted opportunities to connect with other survivors were interesting related to um, negative health and psychosocial risks in this, in this population. And so future research is needed to understand uh, for who might emphasizing culture and connecting with other survivors be more important in terms of relating to health and psychosocial risks in this community. And previous research demonstrates that LGBTQ intimate partner violence who perceived overall greater trauma-informed care in their services reported greater empowerment and emotion regulation and lower social withdrawal, which we know are critical factors to improving mental health and physical health uh, over the lifespan. In mental health counseling, a successful therapeutic process depends on meaningful provider-client relationships. And this requires effective communication and promotion of clients' sense of agency and respect. And fostering agency and mutual respect is important when working with LGBTQ and partner violence survivors, as some LGBTQ people may exhibit hypervigilance and anxiety related to uh, perceiving non-affirming treatment options. This can be achieved through relatively simple ways. This could look like providers making clear that the client is in the driver's seat throughout treatment, and that is ultimately the client's decision to seek and engage in services, and providing clear expectations and explanations about the therapeutic process, like goals and expectations for how long treatment might look like. This may further foster LGBTQ individuals' um, experience of agency. And of course, it's important to convey a non-intrusive, judgment-free, positive regard of LGBTQ clients' experiences, um, as well as respecting LGBTQ clients' pace and level of insight, while uh, remain equally important as, a, as in their partner violence may hesitate to disclose their sexual and gender identity as well as their victimization experiences, again, both to informal supports, um, domestic violence specific forms of supports and other formal, other formal services like mental health counseling more generally. And trauma-informed care approaches which generally focus on safety, trustworthiness and collaboration, um, empowerment and choice and are delivered in the context of other evidence-based treatment components um, that we know are, are shown to reduce um, substance misuse and alcohol misuse and improve mental health. Um, for example, cognitive behavioral techniques or prolonged exposure. This could be beneficial for LGBTQ intimate partner violence survivors. For example, providers who are serving LGBTQ intimate partner violence survivors might use exposure procedures that, that happen either imaginally or in vivo. Um, they may conduct these exposure procedures in safe and affirming environments to improve these client skills for tolerating difficult emotions that might be associated with trauma and minority stress, given the likelihood that this population will experience trauma and minority stress in the future. So it's important to try to equip um, LGBTQ survivors with adequate resources, both internally and externally, uh, to cope effectively with some of these stressors. Trauma-informed care approaches should also be accompanied by sexual risk prevention and intervention efforts um, for LGBTQ folks. This might look like sexuality-specific social support, like support regarding engaging in sexual practices, thinking about unique sexual risk behaviors, um, like HIV-related risk behaviors, represent important avenues for intervention when working with intimate partner violence-exposed LGBTQ folks and reducing help-seeking barriers among sexual and gender minority individuals who experience intimate partner violence requires prevention and intervention efforts that are focused on enhancing affirmative training among providers, agencies, and services. To prevent enacted um, sexual and gender minority stigma in healthcare um, and legal settings, agencies and providers should implement interventions that promote the use of inclusive language and services um, like asking the, the survivor what kind of pronouns they might use, what their preferred name is, or what their sexual and gender identity is, awareness of minority stressors, um, both at the individual level, such as internalized feelings of shame or one's concealment of their identities, interpersonal levels. This might look like 
um, bullying behavior or other forms of victimization and structural levels. This might look like anti-LGBTQ policies and norms that exist across systems and policies. Um, being educated on the bidirectionality of abuse, as we know, this is common in general populations and also is found among LGBTQ populations, um, as well as the unique power and control dynamics in sexual and gender minority relationships. Again, based on the, the relative positionality that one or both um, partners may experience within the relationship and also within their um, broader context of thinking about um, homophobia and transphobia. As well as being aware of the unique strengths and resiliencies in this population who endures chronic um, and persistent stressors across the lifespan uh, may develop unique sources of uh, strengths and support as a, as a result of overcoming um, some of these adversities. It's also important to recognize that sexual and gender minority uh, individuals disclose intimate partner violence more often to their informal support, such as family, friends, and the community, more so than to formal supports like uh, primary care providers or emergency personnel. We also know that feelings of community connectedness and belonging protects against the effects of stigma and violence. And so activists and allies should continue to raise awareness among um, sexual and gender minority individuals, as well as the larger public about intimate partner violence in this community uh, to dispel myths that violence doesn't happen in LGBTQ relationships, um, that it's legitimate and that um, LGBTQ individuals um, navigate multiple, um, multiple stressors across, um, across different domains, both when seeking services um, and also in engaging in treatment. Providers should also work to address social support, spirituality, and modifiable mechanisms, or these are mechanisms that interventions have shown to be able to intervene on, like feelings of shame, helping to bolster emotion regulation strategy, strategies like uh, distress tolerance or changing one's appraisal of the situation in order to cope more effectively, um, to buffer these negative effects of trauma and minority stress on health in this population. Providers might work to mobilize sexual and gender minority individuals to access support, again, from other LGBTQ people. Providers might also help sexual and gender minority individuals navigate disclosing their sexual orientation and gender identity, discussing who they may be out to and why, given that one predictor of positive health um, and healthcare utilization is disclosure. However, we also know that um, that the, the more likely that one is to be out about their sexual and gender minority status, the more likely they are to experience uh, discrimination, prejudice, and stigma. However, we know that those who are out are more likely to access resources and social support and rely on, um, rely on care from their community members. So providers are encouraged to delicately think about the ways that um, disclosing identity is relevant in this community. Providers might also work to incorporate um, other evidence-based treatments that target specific symptom clusters. Um, they may focus on mobilizing resources and also frame, reframe minority stressors, such as some of the recent LGBTQ affirmative uh, treatments that have been um, developed increasingly for sexual minority men, um, for young LGBTQ people, and increasingly sexual minority women. Providers also might assess for minority stressors, violence and health risk behaviors like uh, substance use and misuse and healthcare utilization uh, patterns and barriers. And I believe that is it. Um, so I look forward to taking your questions. Well, there are lots of them, Dr. Shear. So we're, we're going to um, jump right into that. And I'm going to bring in my colleague, Annalise Stratman. Um, so that we can get as many of the questions um, sorted and presented to you as possible. So first of all, thank you for that stimulating presentation and informative. And as I said, we'll launch right into the questions. And I'm going to start with just a, a basic one. The 1,200 plus people that were here for most of your presentation are largely Canadian, are working in the Canadian context. And one of the questions was, you shared some really compelling US stats. And can you speak to what we know in terms of um, Canadian stats? Would we expect to see um, 
relatively the same kinds of proportions of violence in sexual gender minorities? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so, you know, research is, is burgeoning and in the Canadian context, there's several leaders in this area, including Dr. Uh, Alexa Martin Story, um, who, who studies specifically uh, violence and victimization in LGBTQ populations. And rates are, are um, uh, of this burgeoning re research uh, shows similar rates in terms of healthcare access and um, health disparities and violence exposure. I think taking a unique cultural context is important though in thinking about different laws and policies that may uh, kind of mitigate um, you know, individual, LGBTQ individuals' ability to access services and overall treatment satisfaction, uh, which is important to think about in future research contexts. But largely uh, the patterns are, are persistent um, in North America broadly. And just before Anna Lee goes, we just want to do a terminology piece here. Uh, and it always comes up every time there's a, a topic that's relevant. Um, and the question is really that it, the language is evolving. And we know that we've gone from LGBTQ plus to um, 2S LGBTQIA plus. And the question is really around what's the significance we see more and more people leaving out the 2s or they leave out the plus and just can you comment on that and do you think there's a more inclusive way of doing um justice to representing um these groups yeah really excellent question um i mean i learn i learn information almost every day from the work that i do based on um about folks' um, different ways of engaging in these terms, and a lot of which has different political and social and cultural significance for different populations. So you know, I think the best practice for um, folks who are working with this community is, is simply to ask, um, you know, how one prefers to, to be, uh, to identify. And, you know, if you have different um, materials or intakes, or even if you're doing a research study, it's important to let folks, um, provide their own definitions of their sexual and gender identity so that you can get a sense of if there are um, different, different shifts in language based on when you might be uh, conducting that, the research or providing those services. And so I'm not sure there's a one size fits all, you know, for this community. I think as this community gains more funding and visibility, we see more, um, more variation in terms that are more preferred. Um, and as we understand, you know, kind of the nuances in those definitions, some, some may hold better than others. Uh, I know as a researcher who works very closely with community partners, um, how, we may ref how we may term LGBTQ or two-spirit LGBTQIA plus folks in the literature looks very different from how folks are identifying within the community. And so being mindful of, of looking to bridge the research and practice gap of, um, of uh, being as affirming as possible. Uh, very helpful. Ellie? Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, somebody has asked, is wondering here, you spoke a little bit about the help seeking patterns for sexual gender minority people and that most will initially disclose to informal supports before they'll go to formal supports or others that don't necessarily uh, address IPV um, out in the public, etc. And so they're wondering, is there you know, are, are there studies as to why um, people choose to dis do their help seeking in these ways? And were there any overarching themes that have come out of that research? Yeah, excellent, excellent question. So okay. some of this work I'm doing right now with, um, you know, a local domestic violence sexual assault agency doing a community-based needs assessment in, in upstate New York, um, many of whom are low resourced, um, you know, who may not be able to access formal services as readily. But um, from the literature, what we know is that LGBTQ people are more likely to avoid seeking services generally uh, related to primary care, mental health services, substance use services, um, because of reasons related to, to anticipating stigma from providers, actually experiencing discrimination or rejection, um, or receiving services that are not affirming. Um, uh, so, so for example, you may have a transgender woman who uh, is needing emergency shelter services, seeking domestic violence shelter um, that is for women only, but may not see that client as um, 
you know, as, as being an appropriate client given their transgender status. And so uh, there's a lot of barriers to accessing needed support in that regard. Um, many LGBTQ folks from the literature um, who rely on police enforcement and law enforcement um, to intervene during in instances of intimate partner violence are often both arrested uh, for being perceived as perpetrators when they may be victims of perpetration of uh, intimate partner violence. Um, you know, so we see a lot of mutual arrests or dismissal of violence um, more generally, given the kind of historical context of battered women's syndrome and, and, all, and, and um, the feminist movement more generally. So I think um, if I had to distill it down from what we know in the literature is, um, I, I, you know, navigating experiences of stigma and, and, and the ways that that can get in the way of, um, of seeking help and also not wanting to bring more shame about into the community. And so folks are more likely to, you know, again, turn to uh, informal sources of support um, because of increased comfort, increased access. Uh, we know a lot of LGBTQ people living in more stigmatized areas or that might be more rural. They, more, they may have difficulty accessing transportation and have health insurance and all these um, kind of factors get in the way of, uh, of seeking formal services. Thank you. You know, just speaking of stigma and building on that, Dr. Shear, one of our participants is working on a federal project that hopes to improve the media's way of reporting on gender-based violence and um, gender issues, and wonders what you would suggest are the primary problems with how media report on gender-based violence involving SGM individuals. Mm -hmm. It's another really great question, I think, is a study in and of itself. Um, you know, I think that, um, I think one limitation is, um, as we talked about earlier, about kind of the unique nuances within this LGBTQ umbrella of people who may identify as gender minorities versus sexual minorities, people who identify as monosexual versus bisexual. And each of these subgroups has different risk factors, different protective factors, um, uh, different rates of experiencing violence and overall, overall um, health burden. And so I think um, as this community has been gaining more attention in the media um, and thinking about the prevalence of intimate partner violence and ways to support this community, um, I think that, um, I think that um, from the broad kind of social, social media perspective, uh, being, you know, talking a little bit more specifically about the nuances within each subgroup is a direction that we need to go. Um, I think, again, avoiding stigmatizing um, certain groups as being more likely to perpetrate violence against others. So like I talked about, <coughs> excuse me, experiences of minority stressors increase one's likelihood of perpetrating violence. However, it's important to contextualize that. So um, to avoid, again, over pathologizing LGBTQ people, who might be more likely to perpetrate violence because, because of a source of vulnerability related to their stigmatized identity. Which again, it's just so appreciated your sharing with us the resilience normative piece. And, mm -hmm. and I think we want to keep that front and center. Mm -hmm. Another person is wondering if you have any ideas for resources for starting LGBTQS plus um, groups support groups. Any great ideas or resources that you can name? Uh, yeah, so there's um, the WPATH um, has a lot of resources around, um, around providing resources for LGBTQ individuals. Um, the local domestic violence sexual assault agency I work with here in, in the States has a lot of great resources called Vera House that I'm happy to share information about. Of course, it'd be important to look at specifically within the Canadian context about um, local and national resources. Um, but I would I would encourage folks to think broadly about um, where where LGBTQ people might be accessing support. Um, you know, so it may look like increasing uh, prevention education in school systems. Um, you know, to kind of change norms around what does an apartment partner violence look like. Can LGBTQ people perpetrate and experience violence? Um, yeah, so I see someone put in the chat here, WPATH. Um, so there's a lot of great, um, there's a lot of great resources. Um, there's still a lot of research to, um, 
test some of these interventions um, through evidence-based means like randomized control trials. Um, so there's a lot of work still to be done, a lot of funding in this area um, that's needed to think about prevention and intervention approaches. Thank you. Dr. Shear, our center does a fair bit of work uh, looking at um, separation and especially high conflict separations within the context of intimate partner violence, um, but also high conflict when there isn't intimate partner violence. And one of the questions that has come forward is, do you have any specific knowledge on the challenges that might be faced by two SLGBTQIA plus individuals who are navigating high conflict divorce and co-parenting? And I suppose within a court system that may not be educated to the extent we would like them to be. Right, exactly. So, <clears throat> you know, in addition to navigating the interpersonal dynamic and conflict within the, within the relationship, there is this larger systems related issue of navigating, um, uh, facing stigma and, um, you know, lack of, lack of kind of institutional support, um, um, you know, within the law, law you know, and um, uh, justice system more broadly. I think one of the emerging um, findings in the literature among people who are navigating kind of high conflict um, separations in this way is that LGBTQ people tend to stay in, in abusive relationships uh, longer because of their reliance on their partner for um, financial support, uh, for social support, um, given that many LGBTQ people may experience family-related rejection or estrangement, uh, they may be more isolated from other communities. Um, and so thinking about the ways that, um, that isolation and re reliance on, on a potentially abusive partner um, can prevent one's um, ability to leave um, you know, or access support uh, uh, legally to, to protect oneself. And, and thinking about um, custody complications especially if maybe both, you know, one or both um, caregivers might not be, they may not be legally represented in the court, you know, through marriage, or they may not be um, uh, legally adoptive parents through the court systems, given different, um, different stigmatizing laws and policies. And so it's, it's certainly an, act, an additional uh, stressor to navigate. Sure. Okay, so we have some researchers here in Canada, Jillian, who are working on a federally funded project to um, improve how the media report on gender-based violence and gender issues. And so they are looking for some ideas. What would you suggest are the primary problems with how media report on gender-based violence involving two SLGBTQQIA plus folks? Could I jump in there for a minute? Annalie, I snuck that question in when you were reading other questions. So oh, sorry. I already answered that question. Oh, I am so sorry. No, Thank don't you. be sorry. You regroup, and I'm going to ask another question while you regroup. Um, but speaking of colleagues in Canada, there's a wonderful program coming out of Trois-Rivières in Quebec at University of Quebec. And colleagues of ours are doing the STEP program. And that project aims to better understand the experiences of parenthood after being exposed to significant stressors during childhood. And the program designs and offers and evaluates supports for adults who are expecting a child and who have difficult experiences during their childhood. Do you have any ideas of any barriers that members of SGM groups might face in that program or ideas on how to make the program more accessible? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the program sounds fascinating. I would love to hear more about it. Um, you know, there is research showing that um, LGBTQ uh, sexual and gender minority individuals are at disproportionate risk of experiencing adverse childhood events. Um, and this might be directly related to um, having come out at an early age or um, perpetrators suspecting a sexual and gender minority individual. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the ways that those identities are pathologized from very early on. Um, and we know that experiences of early 
childhood experiences are folks who experience childhood abuse are more likely to experience dating violence and partner violence are more likely to perpetrate in partner violence. And all of these kind of compounding experiences of, of stress exposure um, can get in the way of, of one's ability to kind of interface with prevention and intervention um, approaches. So I think reducing the stigma of engaging in a program like this and, and thinking about who might be the most at risk based on early childhood experiences um, is, will, you know, is, is, is critical. We've, um, I will just share briefly, I have a grant under review with a colleague that's looking to create a prevention program for LGBTQ folks, um, young people in the US who are living in high stigmatized areas and rural counties to develop a prevention framework and specifically looking towards a mentoring based approach. So using sexual and gender minority mentors as, um, as models for processing some of these events and engaging in more healthy coping strategies and, and adaptive behaviors, um, given that we know that folks are more likely to kind of seek out um, support networks um, based on, on some on mentorship models. I'm going to try again here. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we have somebody who's wondering if, and I just want to go back a step here and, and ask you a little bit, to speak a little bit more about um, your findings when using the model that you developed um, and working with service providers. Just to be clear, the findings were that IPV survivors' perceptions of providers who focused on culture and connecting with other survivors was related to health and negative health and psychosocial risks, correct? Yes, it was. Can you elaborate on that a bit, please? Yes, it was interesting and an unexpected finding. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's always limitations with cross-sectional, you know, non-causal relationships. Um, but we hypothesized that, you know, maybe for someone who um, may be experiencing high degrees of shame uh, within their community related to their LGBTQ identity, if a provider overemphasizes the importance of their culture within the therapy context or other kind of service context, that might actually increase one's experiences of negative emotions. And so they may then report kind of decreased mental health. Um, and similarly, you know, talking about connecting with other survivors without, a, you know, also speaking to the increased likelihood of sexual risk taking as a way of coping with with minority stress and stigma and trauma in this population uh, is important. But, you know, for some of these findings that are unexpected, we always think about, well, for whom might those associations be, be driving that, that, that association? And so that's an important follow-up question um, or follow-up study to that question. Okay, super, thank you. So it's somewhat related, but going off on a little bit of a different direction here. Um, you mentioned the importance of targeted supports. And the observation was made, do we have a little bit of a conundrum here? How do we do targeted supports without outing individuals? Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? Yes, absolutely. You know, so this might look as easy as um, having an LGBTQ rainbow flag in your office or like, you know, asking more open-ended questions like um, what pronouns do you use or um, not, a, not assuming that a woman who walks into your office might be partnered with a man. So kind of conveying some of these non, non-judgmental, open, affirming stances with all of your clients who come in may help someone be cued into to understanding that this is, a, this is an especially affirming place. So this is a place that feels safe um, also, as you're, as you're engaging in safety planning with LGBTQ survivors, it is important to think about um, who are safe people that that person might be out to. Um, one thing we also know in the literature is avoiding pressuring LGBTQ people from coming out as part of disclosing experiences of IPV. And so uh, this is an important thing to, to help survivors navigate what might be the pros and cons of disclosing your identity um, if you can't come into the office because that might be outing, is there another way that we can get you services more virtually or in another kind of safe space? And, you know, with the pandemic, I think we've all um, been forced to think a little bit more creatively about connecting survivors with services. So that's um, increasingly apparent also with LGBTQ folks. 
definitely. So um, as you know, um, when um, people are experiencing intimate partner violence, there, there can be a lot of physical abuse that leads to various kinds of trauma and injuries. And um, we have a researcher here in Canada who is particularly interested in traumatic brain injury um, um, as related to intimate partner violence. And um, this person is wondering if you have a, a, a sense of what the rate, rate of traumatic brain injury might be um, in the study that you reported from 2019, who had experienced physical abuse in the relationship. Yeah, it's, it's a really, really good question. You know, I, I really can't think of any studies who have, have looked at that. So um, I think it's, it will be a follow-up study. I'm you know, interested in, in, in collaborating certainly with folks if you're interested. I, I can't recall very many studies um, or if any that have looked at traumatic brain injury specifically in this community. I suspect that it would be higher given the likelihood of, um, of severe forms of physical violence and threats of physical violence in this community. Um, but that you know certainly remains to be uh, to be tested. Um, but I'd be interested in learning more about that. And then going out on a limb here, since we don't have a lot of information about that, but um, thinking about traumatic brain injuries, how might um, knowing about those kinds of injuries and the effects that they have might how might that impact on how we provide trauma informed care? Yeah, really great question. I mean, I think like anything else, the more that we understand, the more that we know how to intervene on. And so without knowing if this is a um, kind of an overall health burden that's disproportionately affecting this population, um, we may not know how to treat it. And certainly thinking about intersection with any kind of medical diagnosis or medical intervention, um, you know, it's important to think about the ways that that medical related um, issues may exacerbate mental health related issues like depression, PTSD, uh, one's likelihood of using substances to potentially cope with some of those experiences. And so the more that we can identify what those prevalence rates are, I think the better we can think about ways of, of tailoring interventions to intervene on some of those mechanisms. Thank you. Dr. Shear, in our country, there are a lot of tables that are considering what the impact of heteronormative framing of anti-violence movement on help seeking is for SGM uh, communities. And um, so just even as an example, the way violence is often framed as uh, in the movement as a man's violence against women. And we just wondered, in addition to your own thoughts, which are very welcome, is there research that's looked specifically at the impact of that heteronormative framing? Yes, yeah, so excellent, excellent question. You know, that this Duluth power and control model that is very much, you know, kind of rooted in the heteronormative patriarchy for good reason, you know, in terms of being able to provide access to women survivors um, who are of disproportionate risk of intimate partner violence. There has been research that's looked at um, the ways that other forms of structural kinds of stigma like anti-LGBTQ stigma interface with, um, with heteronormative structures and, and patriarchy. Uh, my colleagues and I did a study looking at gender-based structural stigma across 28 countries in Europe. And so, Gender-based structural stigma looked at gender equality more broadly. And we looked at countries that had higher levels of gender equality were women or immigrant women and were sexual minority women more likely or less likely to experience intimate partner violence. And we found that countries that were more egalitarian um, were worse for women generally and, and also for sexual minority women and we conceptualize that as this form of backlash against, you know, kind of gender equal societies. There might be um, more, more backlash to advancing um, and gaining more power and control within society. Um, but there, there, it remains to be seen the ways that gender based equality and LGBTQ related equality may interact to, um, you know, inform one's risk of violence and also thinking about help seeking. Um, so I, I think it remains to be seen largely, but there are some models that are coming out and thinking about kind of deconstructing some of these ideologies and norms around, um, around 
use of violence in relationships and status and power? I hope that the people that are working on a paper for our center right now are tuned in and listening. <laughs> and, and we'll share that paper with you. Uh, yes, when please do. Please. please do. So um, one more question is, how do you provide, thinking about trauma-informed principles and safety, et cetera, how do you provide inclusive support to an individual which may traumatize other group members? So for example, a transgendered individual with apparent male features who was abused in a relationship participating in a women's partner violence program. Right, so we're seeing some of these, um, we're seeing some of the complexity around this in our, you know, in our local domestic violence sexual assault uh, organization that serves a large population of LGBTQ folks. Um, and we're conducting a study right now that asks survivors their comfort level of being in a, in a group with people who are a different gender, different race, different sexuality, different age, you know, different trauma and exposure to, to better understand the ways that, um, that one's comfort level might impede, you know, the, inclusiv the inclusivity of the group. I think, of course, it is important to be um, mindful of what might trigger one survivor versus another. Um, however, you know, it, it's important to also look at the, the larger context of, um, transgender women are likely not able to access very many services. And so if, if they are inclined to seek a particular service, it, it, it may be helpful to educate other survivors in the group or, or providers about the importance of, um, of, of, of having a kind of inclusive, all, all is welcome. Um, but it, it is a delicate issue in terms of um, not wanting to uh, alienate survivors based on their, their histories or um, you know, or, or even beliefs. And so I, I think it is a, a delicate issue that's, that's still being uncovered in the, in the literature. Thank you, Dr. Shear, we're at the end. And just before we thank you for your generosity in spending this much time and fielding questions and uh, preparing this very informative talk, I wondered if you would just um, share with us at this point, what are you most inspired or excited about in this work that you're doing? What do you see as maybe um, uh, a hopeful direction or perhaps just something that you're excited about learning more about or something that represents perhaps a larger change if beyond the research, beyond the community and ivory tower partnership for research, something that may flag um, progress in terms of the um, societal and system level? Yeah, really great question. I mean, I, I think about prevention and, inter and intervention. So being able to increase access to underserved populations, particularly sexual and gender minority survivors, um, and thinking about ways of creating culturally tailored, personalized treatment efforts for those who are already in the door helping them um, navigate in violence situations and improving health outcomes. And so I think, I think the epidemiological research is there. We know this, these rates are problematic. We know who's most at risk. We have a sense about why you know, there is theory generativity there. But now thinking about helping to increase actual access, reduce help-seeking behaviors, and improve treatments, I think is where, where we need to go. Mm. Well, that is exciting. And uh, we're glad that you're helping to lead the way uh, in that direction. And again, thank you so much. And I want to remind all of our participants to please check for the evaluation link in the chat box um, and to share that with us. And I know that some of you've had to leave, but to the um, 743 that are still with us, thank you very much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Be safe. Excellent. Take care. Thank you.